Hello and thank you and welcome to the Royal Society of Victoria. Welcome to Science Gossip. This is an event presented as part of Climate's Art Plus Climate Equals Change 2019 Festival. And hello, I'm Renee Beale and I'm the producer of Science Gossip, a new series, a new experiment for the RSV this evening. So thank you for being with us on our inaugural. The Science Gossip series is actually named after a 19th century um, science journal of which we have several copies in the library tonight and we've actually got some on display this evening so you'll be able to actually see them when you go into our library um, later on this evening. So Science Gossip actually provides a forum for new ideas, hypotheses and research findings to be presented through salon-style discussions, exhibits and performances. Concerned with where science meets culture, science gossip events involve scientists alongside artists, philosophers and other experts to examine new knowledge and questions relating to our evolving society. Science gossip is being held on the lands of the Wurundjeri people and I wish to acknowledge them as the traditional owners. I would also like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to any other Indigenous Australians um, with us this evening. The Wurundjeri people are this region's first scientists, patiently observing and sometimes gently shaping the ecosystem they so effectively cared for for thousands of years. As a scientist, I'm humbled by the deep knowledge of the Wurundjeri and other Indigenous communities and I feel incredibly grateful for their generosity in reaching out to educate and work with scientists in how we can best care for country together. The tree knowledge that we will discuss as part of this evening, Indigenous people knew and know. It's just taking Western science a while to catch up. Now to our science gossip uh, event this evening, Woodland Rumours and Thinking Trees. What do trees know? Should we have asked this question 20 years ago, we might have been advised that trees know very little. And a better question to ask is what, the, what do humans know about trees? Trees are inexplicably associated with the burgeoning of life on this planet. The creators and masterminds of the oxygen-rich environments and atmospheric, atmospheric conditions and sustenance vital to animal life. Yet evolving out of the primordial soup prior to animals, has not afforded trees a privileged position. For centuries, the prevailing scientific and philosophic, philosophical views have taught us that trees are but one rung on the ladder higher than inanimate objects. Having no mechanism for movement, and in particular, no capacity for language, memory, or thought. But we might have been mistaken. Traditionally, botanists and plant physiologists have worked diligently to characterise, systematise and dissect tree species, understanding the anatomy of trees in comparison to the animal kingdom and positioning trees in the phylogeny of life. More recently, climate scientists have illuminated the critical role trees play as carbon sinks, taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and storing it within their organism, placing trees as the frontline troops in the war against climate change. Now, new research is blossoming on how trees function quite aside from their anatomical differences with animals, with remarkable findings. It seems that trees have been communicating all along with a language quite distinct from our own. Using highly specialised chemical and oral signalling, trees warn each other of the dangers and ward off and attract insects and other animal life as necessary. Importantly, when one tree speaks, nearby trees listen and respond by passing on the message. As our keynote speaker this evening, Monica Gagliano, will explain shortly, trees hear environmental cues such as running water and respond by sending roots in the direction of the water and have the capacity to learn and retain memories salient experiences and salient experiences with bioacoustic um, research in its infancy we have much to discover about tree chatter and much to delight in as musician and acoustic ecologist Vicky Hallett will show us at the close of this event. 
This tree chatter hints at the complexities of connection and community within the forest ecosystem. Mycologist Sapphire McMullen Fisher will lead discussions around the importance of fungi in tree community. Symbiotic fungal networks living in the tree roots allow the ready uptake of nutrients from the soil for each individual, but notably in natural forest ecosystems, these, fungal, these fungi allow neighbours to share nutrients. The sick are provided for until they heal and the young are mothered and sheltered. Survival, trees seem to know, is reliant on the well-being of many rather than the fitness of the individual. Trees have long captured artistic imagination, evidence in the multitude of stories from children's fables and tales to popular science books. Landscape painting boasts a rich tradition of calling the wonders of, our, of natural forest environments to our attention. And metaphorical ad adaptations of trees abound in philosophical and religious texts. Downstairs, you will have the opportunity to encounter some of artist Adam Madeline's work, which draws together animation, natural objects, and scientific knowledge to explore what trees know. Despite art, our art, stories, and texts in our modern individualized urban life, a phenomenon known as plant blindness is gaining prominence. Many of us simply fail to notice the trees within our perceptual field, let alone consider their inner, inner lives. Environmental philosopher Freya Matthews invites us to discuss possible paradigm shifts required to remedy plant blindness and the importance of collaborating with Indigenous communities along the journey. Alongside the presenters tonight, who aim to reveal some of the secrets of forest communication, connection and community, I invite you to really see trees and to re-examine your relationship with them. Perhaps we humans have always suspected trees were living lives to which we weren't fully privy, and that tree wisdom extends beyond what we thought we knew about them. Join us to be inspired with new knowledge and to imagine what we may find trees know in the future and what they can teach us. Now, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our keynote presenter this evening, Dr. Monica Gagliano. Monica Gagliano is a research associate professor of uh, evolutionary ecology. She is currently based at the University of Sydney as a research affiliate at the Sydney, Uni uh, Sydney Im Environment Institute and a senior research fellow at the School of Life and Environment, um, Environmental Sciences, opening the doors of a brand new B BI lab, Bio Biological Intelligence Lab. She is the author of numerous scientific articles in the field of animal and plant behavioural and evolutionary ecology and is a co-editor of The Green Thread, Dialogues with the Vegetal World and the Language of Plants, Science, Philosophy and Literature and is the author of a new book, Thus Spoke the Plant, which we have some copies downstairs and many of you have already pre-purchased. Monica's, Monica's work has extended the uh, concept of cognition, including perception, learning processes, memory and consciousness in plants. She has pioneered the brand new research field of plant bioacoustics for the, for the first time experimentally demonstrating that plants emit their own voices and moreover detect and respond to the sounds of their environments. Thanks, Monica. Welcome. Thank you. I already apologize for the big mouthful when they had to describe who we are. It's like, yeah, she's worked there, there, and there. We had to just acknowledge all the people that kind of hold us in place. <laughs> the title of this event kind of inspired me to go to the dictionary and have a look at the definition of gossip. And this is the Oxford Dictionary. And the important thing about the definition is that whatever you're doing when you're gossiping, <laughs> Uh, you're actually involved in details about someone else. And usually when we think of someone else, we think of human people. But in this case, the people that we are going to be talking about are not necessarily human. And the important thing is, like, you're talking about giving away details of things that 
might not be true. And in most cases, gossip are gossip because they're not true. So I wonder what are the stories that we tell about plants, especially as Western culture, and then what are the stories that plants have to tell us? And, uh, and you see that maybe some of those things don't really match very well. So like all stories, this one also starts with Once Upon a Time. And uh, in this case, we're going to go back in time, and you already mentioned, this story starts millennia ago. And, uh, and it kind of starts with this guy, who is a famous philosopher, and he's kind of considered the father of modern science to some degree. Uh, the thing that is interesting about Aristotle is that he was quite interested in the soul, which, of course, in the context of science, is like, what? She's going to talk about the soul? Well, he was interested about the soul because um, he had his own definition. And for him, it was the act of a natural body with the capacity for life. So by this definition, then pretty much anything that is alive and has got a body would also have a, a, a soul that is, you know, providing that act, action. Now, the interesting thing about him was that uh, compared to what we have done in more recent centuries in, again, Western culture, he wasn't dualistic about it. It wasn't like, oh, body and soul or, you know, any of that. Actually, he was interested in the fact that the two together make up one substance. And I'm not a philosopher, so I'm just taking the liberty to use these terms as I like. <laughs> so take whatever you want out of this. And the other thing that he was interested in, and I guess this comes a little bit, uh, emer this is the emergence of the scientific mind in the sense of like uh, boxing and organizing knowledge, which is something that we have become very good at. So he decided that, okay, well, we got obviously different forms and different bodies doing different things. So let's create a, bit, a few boxes to distinguish between different souls. And so he recognized that there were kind of three major groups of souls, according to him. And the first one he called the vegetative. And the function of the vegetative soul is just about nutrition and reproduction. Then you have the sensitive soul, and that is the one that perceives and responds to the surrounding environment. And then, of course, the important one, the rational soul, which is apparently the, thing, the, the one that speak and presumably think. Now, it's not difficult to see how the three groups kind of overlap with three hierarchical groups that we can recognize very easily. The first one would have been the plants, then you had the animals, and then the humans, as if the humans were not animals already, yeah? Now, the interesting thing about this hierarchy, so, okay, he created some boxes, and then he didn't just um, said, okay, you got plants on one side, animals on the other side, and the human over here. No, he thought, well, okay, the plants are one group, and then the animal is... Uh, you know, it contains a particular soul, which is the, the sensitive soul, but it's got the plant soul or the vegetative soul included within. And then the human, by default, includes both of those previous two. So it's like a matrioska uh, doll, right? So you have the small one in the center is the plant, and then you have the animals that is the one surrounding, and the one even more outer is the human. Now, there is a very interesting fact about the matrioskas as they're built, like the actual dolls. Uh, they're built out of one piece of wood, and they're built uh, so that the center, it's uh, a core, and is not, you can't open it, you can't pull it apart. So the core stays, and everything else is built around that core. So if this one is a matrioska doll, the core is over there into the plant and the vegetal world, and the others are just built around that shape. So the humans really are also containing the plant inside, right in the center. And that it's an interesting concept to keep in mind, just leave it there, <laughs> hanging, for when we go back to it at the end. Now, so th then something weird happened to this man. Like, maybe he quarreled with, with someone, or he didn't have a good night's sleep, I don't know. But the, some morning, he got up, and obviously with the wrong foot, and he decided, you know what, we need to separate further these groups. And so, 
just uh, pretty much by randomness, he decided, well, what am I going to pick to just separate these groups? And he decided that sensitivity or insensitivity was a good way to separate the plants from the animals. This is where the science in him, the scientist in him, really fails. <laughs> because it's like, and what, it, what was the criteria for that? No criteria, just because I can, because I'm Aristotle, and everyone that is going to listen to me is going to believe me, and that's exactly what happened. Everyone that came after him for millennia just gave automatically, it, it was assumed that he was right. And the influence of this one man and his, his ideas is still here now, despite many more philosophizing minds throughout history, which is quite cool. If I was Aristotle, I would be very proud of myself. <laughs> now, what in effect happened with this is that, whether he meant it or not, but by calling the plants insensitive, which means that literally do, they do not sense, they do not feel the world, they, they do not perceive anything, well, you're kind of objectifying them. You're saying that they, they have a soul, but that soul doesn't actually act as life. It's just an object, lifeless. So you can see how easy it is to then become a nothing of no importance, something that can be replaced, something that can be thrown away easily. The only little problem with this is that, if you remember the matrioska, if the matrioska metaphor works and the little plant that sits in the core of the human is also objectified, then we are, by objectifying the plant soul, we are objectifying the very core of the human too. So we might not like plants, we might want to be we were quite fine to objectify them, but by objectifying them, we are also doing it here, which is not cool. <laughs> now, as I said, everyone that came after him basically has been influenced by his thinking, and these ideas are still here, alive and kicking, <laughs> and um, and we are gonna fast forward in time to see what when these ideas have actually become obvious the impact of them in our modern culture. So a few millennia later in our story, we are in 1999. Science, which as probably many of you are aware, is pretty much the top journal in scientific exploration. <laughs> Science has a special issue on plant biotechnology. And you're like, OK. And as you can see, food and feed Suddenly, plant biotechnology is associated to we're going to save the world from starvation. Again, another definition here. Biotechnology, and this is the definition from the UN, is uh, about using biological system. It's about making, modifying living entities, living organisms, for specific uses. You use objects. You can't use entities and living organisms that have their own story and their own lives. So when we talk about plant biotechnology, automatically we're talking about objectifying someone. In this case, plants, obviously. And what is interesting is that the, uh, the editors of this special issue started uh, this issue talking about oh, we're going to have a plant revolution without realizing the story is millennia old. It was the dude that got up out of bed with, you know, not in a great mood, and you think you're making a revolution. <laughs> there was nothing really new in the concept of what was proposed here. What was interesting, though, was the reciting the, the glory <laughs> of this apparently new approach to. And of course, the entire article is all about the achievements and benefits that plant biotechnology, plant engineering would, do, would contribute to food security, which of course is another keyword that we're still hearing very much so all the time because uh, it's important, right? We need to have our food. And, um, and it's interesting because I have to say, I've never ever seen any research done that makes prediction that then when you look, you fast forward in time, the prediction are like almost 100% precise. Like, uh, no error. 
except for a few things. So they didn't mistake how, many, how much money they would make. They didn't have any error around how much land would be, had, would be cleared and used for this revolution. Um, they knew exactly which country would benefit the most and it would be the avant-garde and the leaders in the field. The only one that they didn't quite get, but you know, you can't be perfect, I guess. Uh, they didn't resolve the food security problem. And I thought that was the reason why we were going to have this revolution. But who not, like, I mean, scientists do the best that they can do. So basically, the point is that they were preaching sameness and uniformity. And there is a major issue with this because nature, on the contrary, <laughs> thrives on diversity and variability. So what Aristotelian thinking has done through the centuries and we're still perpetuating now is this idea that we can control things and the more uh, uniform and under our control we make them, the better. And that's why we are failing quite miserably. <laughs> and uh, because as we know, nature knows exactly how to do it, and it, it thrives on variability, biodiversity, variation, and those are the building blocks that allow for natural selection to operate. So it's actually funny that we would, you know, talk about Darwinian natural selection theory and evolution and all of that, and then we are actually failing to see that we are behaving exactly the opposite way. We are not behaving according to what we are preaching. So where does this go? Well, one interesting professor from Harvard said, I really like this quote <laughs> about stories. He says, stories are the single most powerful weapon in a leader's arsenal. Now, of course, we can all be leaders, so we just need to start telling the right stories and, uh, and maybe uncover those stories that lead, lead nowhere. So I thought that the, the leaders this time could be people which are not necessarily human. Maybe we need a very different perspective. And so what are the stories that plant tell rather than the gossip that we spread about them? <laughs> and because that's what it was, really. Plant, as you know, Rene already mentioned, they have a whole suite of uh, different ways of conversing about and showing themselves. And of course, they have, they have plenty of stories about light, about darkness. Uh, I'm sure many of you probably are aware of the fact that you know, they are very good at picking up different frequency of light and they detect the changes in the ratio between light frequencies. And so they are good at checking out um, the ratio between red infrared, for example, uh, which is light that is bouncing on and off from neighbors. And based on that, they can tell whether oh, the guy next to me is going a bit fast. And I better check and better keep an eye because uh, I might get overshadowed and then I'm going to die. So I had to modify my growth rate so that I can compensate for that. And, you know, so there is a constant monitoring in that sense, for example. And this is only one. Of course, we are all very familiar about, especially in certain time of the years, when all the plants like, are in bloom and they overwhelm us, not with just the color, but the smells. And of course, those are little stories of attraction, our nose, but also the nose of others. And of course, some of those uh, noses are very famous. All of the pollinators are attracted by the colors, by the smells, and you know they, they can't resist. <laughs> uh, some other times, they really can't resist, but maybe the... The, the idea behind or the agenda behind is not quite the same. This is a close-up of uh, a leaf of uh, the Drosera, uh, which is a carnivorous plant. And so the little bubble that you see at the tip of those tentacle-looking things, well, it smells, if I was a bee, I guess, it would smell absolutely delicious. And so the insects go, totally attracted by the smell, cannot resist, and then it's actually not a good ending for the bee or for the insect, because that actually is not nectar or anything sweet and sugary as you would expect, but is pretty much glue. So by the time the insect get close, uh, it can't let go, it can't move anymore, and the plants digest it. Of course, I'm putting these two examples 
close to each other because it highlights that, you know, there is the first example of a bee arriving and, you know, pollinating the plant. And then here where the, the same bee potentially can get eaten by a plant because uh, it highlights again the variability and diversity in nature is done by a dance and a cooperation on multiple levels. And, um, and sometimes we judge it as, oh, this is not very nice, but it's like, it's just how the rhythm and the flow of things are. And, uh, and for us to control them without appreciating that, it's very dangerous. And we know that, we can see the results of that. But of course, you know, chemicals are also, so smells and a, a part of the chemical reservoir, and chemicals are also uh, used, as we know more recently, to plant, for plant, by plant to tell other plant, there might be a problem here, better put your defenses up, I'm under attack. And, uh, and this is, the classic example is with aphids, and aphids are a good example just because you can find them, unfortunately, in your garden. <laughs> If you have a veggie patch, they are the first kind of guys to come and be really annoying on your beautiful plants that you're waiting, you know. But what plants can do is to tell other plants uh, by releasing chemicals, there is a problem here, I'm getting attacked, so get your defenses up. What that does is it actually increases protection for the entire patch. And so it's less likely for more aphids to come along. But then you say, well, if I was the plant that is under attack, what about me, you know? Well, what they do is actually have a cocktail of chemicals. And so some chemicals will be directed to the neighbors to tell them like, guys, there is a problem. And some of the cocktails will be directed to the nose of those that can come and clean up the mess. And so in the scientific literature, this was actually dubbed and the paper was published under this title of crying for help. So we can be creative, <laughs> despite. <laughs> now, of course, um, there are many stories. And one of the stories that um, is more recent and in a way speaks closely to our desire for communicability with the vegetal is about green sensitivities in terms of touch. And one special case in that contest is sound. There are a few plants that are very uh, good example of the vegetal response to touch or vibrations from the environment. Mimosa is one of those. This is Mimosa pudica and uh, is one of the few plants that moves this fast. <laughs> and the reason why we really like this plant and we can appreciate it is because it moves at our time scale. And this really, it, 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 it really shames Aristotle. Because it's like, if we would have seen this plant moving this fast, so at our human time scale, probably would have had other ideas about how plants do things and whether they are alive <laughs> or just objects. Now, there are other plants similar to Mimosa, which move relatively fast and we can appreciate them as, oh, they're doing things, so they're behaving because we're so obsessed with movement. This one is the Venus flytrap. And of course, I don't have to tell you because you can probably guess who is in there trapped. <laughs> but the interesting thing about this plant is that the Venus flytrap, one might think, like, oh, well, every time that there is something arriving, the trap closes and the, the plant is hoping for the best. That's not true. You can see probably from, from the image, there are those hair inside the lobes. So two airs needs to be touched within a particular time frame for the plant to like, haha. This is good dinner. If the time is too long or if the time is too short, it's basically giving a clue. The plant is, is basically measuring who is inside. So if it's something too small of someone, too small, it might not be worth the effort of closing because it's a lot of energy to close and then you have to digest and you have to reopen. And the same is true if the, 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 the visitor is too big because you might not even, you might fail to close your trap and actually have dinner. And so then you are, imagine if you have these, and we have seen pictures of this enormous slug in the middle of the trap and the plant is trying as I, ah, well, <laughs> I'll just pass, you can go. <laughs> so the interesting thing about plants and touch is that we know that there are plenty of touch genes. 
So even at the deeper layer of, you know, the molecular side of this story, beyond the external behavior, there are touch genes, there are mechanoreceptors. This is, we're getting close to what we look at when we look at animals. So suddenly it's like, well, so what is really the difference here? <laughs> it's the form maybe or how things are enacted, but the process, the principle seems to be quite similar. Now, of course, sound, as I mentioned at the beginning, is uh, a kind of special case of touch at a distance. I mean, if you think about what happened to your ears when you're listening now, uh, it is, I'm touching you, I'm touching every one of you, and your little air and the bones and uh, vibrating and translating, to, uh, like transferring the, the, the signal, and then your internal system made of cells, which we call neurons, uh, will transduce. So will change a signal that is a vibration of a mechanical nature into an electrochemical signal, which is what your brain likes to, to, to see. Now, the question of plants making sound or listening to sound, it's an old one. There is plenty of folklore, of course, and as you also mentioned, it's like, how many stories do we have where the oak is having so much to tell? about wisdom and what you should be doing. Or when we have like really naughty plants that lie or any of that. So this idea that uh, plants will talk to us and we will be able to hear them, it's very ingrained. And either it's something that we really like as a story and we keep carrying it through time, or maybe there is something there that we haven't dared exploring. So when you do there, you might find something surprising. <laughs> And, uh, and I guess this is what part of my research uh, did. And what we now know is that plants definitely emit their own sounds. And this is a spectrogram from a corn, a baby corn, from the roots. And um, now the interesting thing about this is that the distance from the source, so from the root, you can measure this signal up to five centimeters away. You might think that that's not very far, but if you are this big and you grow a lot every day, <laughs> uh, five centimeters is a lot because it's likely that a five centimeters distance, someone else around you will pick up that signal and take the information somewhere else. But then upscale, imagine the oak tree, the famous wise one. <laughs> imagine the root system of someone like that. The size under the ground is way much bigger than anything that you see on the top. Imagine the sound that is carried through that system and how far it could really go. And we haven't even started yet to discover how far, how loud, how much information, what kind of information. We're just a little scratchy in the surface. So um, there is something going on here. Now, of course, I'm an animal ecologist by training, so my approach was exactly the same as we would have when we are looking at animals, and what we traditionally and normally do is like, oh well, if I want to know what an animal is listening to, I play back. So I record something, and then I play it back and see what it does. And if it's something that they like, maybe they get interested and they show me a behavior of some kind that I can tell, oh, is interested or is recognizing this call or he doesn't care. Or he flies away, if he's a bird, for example. So the first obstacle with plants is that we have been so used to think of them non-behaving, not doing anything, that we find it difficult even to imagine what they could potentially do if we ask them to show us. So roots are a good place to go because they do grow and they do grow not randomly but in, the, in different direction and which can be quite specific. Now, just like we do with animals, you do playbacks of specific frequencies and then you hope that if the, your subject, animal or plant or whatever, uh, is uh, liking or not liking something, it might show some behavior. So in this case, what we found was that when you play one frequency, one frequency at a time, the roots of these seedlings really don't care 
And then suddenly, so they grow with gravity straight down, and then suddenly they turn when you hit a particular range. And this is the range. So as you can see, the zero is like, this is when there is no sound. And you can see that when you go for 500 upwards, it's pretty much like they are responding as if there is no sound. Now, this is important. It doesn't mean that they're not hearing those frequencies, just that they really, either they, they can't, but it's also possible that they're deciding or choosing not to do anything about it because they are meaningless to them. Of course, the, the exciting part is the part from the 100 to 400 hertz, but most interestingly, the two 300 hertz, because that is the range that this particular species at this life stage seems to be interested in the, in the sound source. And so we have that behavior, and it bends the route towards the, the source. We don't really know why, or kind of. Selecting for what, then? Because ultimately, we, we need to put it in an ecological context if we are really honest about ma making plants, reinstating plants as their subjective selves. So when you look from an ecological perspective, and if there is anyone here that has a garden, maybe you're also uh, already familiar with the idea of buzz pollination. And some plants we kind of have to, we had to do the buzzing because uh, we have constrained them in places where there are no pollinators to do the job. But basically, there are plenty of flower plants, and these are like some famous and common ones, like the blueberries or the tomatoes. So you don't have to go fancy like mimosa or you know, the Venus flytrap, but like very common plants that we kind of interact with all the time. And, um, and there was a very beautiful recent paper that came out just a few months ago, and again, maybe you have come across the, in the news. Uh, but um, what they did is like uh, they recorded the sound of a bee. That, well, they observed what the plant would do when this, the bees is approaching. And, uh, and what they found is that a particular plant is um, basically listening for the bees arriving and increasing the level of sugar that is, av that is making available in the nectar. So it's more attractive, right? It's like, well, you know, there are many plants, but hi, I'm giving you the good stuff. <laughs> now, when they recorded the bee and then played back the bee, so there is no bee. The sound of the bee is there. The plant, like, I know this, there's a bee coming, I know what to do. And so they recorded, they, they detected an increase in the um, level of sugar in the nectar. The, this dance between pollinators and plants is one that we've been fascinated for a long time. And so in a way, it's kind of not really surprising, right? It's like, yeah, th th these two systems have co-evolved for such a long time that we can kind of appreciate that. And in fact, we have known for quite some time that some plants only release the, the, the goodies, the pollen, uh, if they are vibrated at the right frequency. So these guys have co-evolved with those guys. And uh, if another pollinator comes along and tries, the plant is like, nah, not giving it to you. While these guys have evolved to actually vibrate the, their own little bodies at the perfect frequency that the plant knows and the bees knows so that the pollen can be released and the bees can do its job and the plant is, ve is very happy. But Again, more recently, as we started appreciating this and started to ask the question, then we have seen that actually sound is important for plants, like from the plant perspective, uh, in the context of defense, for example. And in one of the studies a few years ago, colleagues from the US showed with this plant, they show how you know, the plant is listening to the sound of a caterpillar eating the leaves. And, uh, and they emit a particular chemical, as we've seen before, is meant to like warn that there is a problem. But then what they did, which is the exciting part, they recorded this guy chewing on the leaves, and then they played the sound of the caterpillar chewing on leaves to a plant that was naive. So the plant hadn't experienced the caterpillar chewing the leaves. It was the only thing that was present, it was just the sound of. And this naive plant responds as if, I know this. This is a caterpillar chewing on the leaves. I don't like this. 
and he starts building up the defenses as if there is a caterpillar inside and he's chewing someone's leaves. And so I better start going and protect myself. And of course, more recently with peas, the common green garden pea, and again, a plant that is around us is nothing special. You know, you don't have to go fancy or exotic. We have seen now our sound actually play a role not only in reproduction, so with the pollinators, not only in defense, but also in the way in which plants can find resources. And of course, one of the resources that plants are after is water. And again, as Rene already gave it away, <laughs> um, I know. <laughs> but what we found was that um, yeah, plants can detect the source of water at a distance uh, without water being even there, but just the sound of. And so, of course, we, we know from a while that plants can sniff the water so that they can detect humidity gradient. But imagine if the humidity gradient stops over there and you're a plant over here. And like, you're so close, but yet not close enough to know that it's over there. But if, because things move all the time, and so water in the soil moves all the time. And so if you can hear it, and of course the sound travels much further than a smell or a chemical, if you can hear it, it will give you a vague idea of the direction. Then as you get closer, you will hit that humidity gradient. It's like, yes, bingo, I got it. And then you can maybe fine tune your growth to the actual source. So this is just, um, these are just beautiful, very recent examples of what, sound, what role sound could play, can play in the life of plants from an ecological perspective, not just some theoretical or you know, lab-based, but like, yeah, these are relevant in the, in the ecological life of these, or, these organisms. And the interesting thing about this one in particular with the water was that um, when you do the playback, so you record the water and then you play back to the plant and, and then the plant responds and it's all good, yay. But then you actually look at the spectrogram where, of, of your recording and there is a lot of energy in different parts of the spectrum, so at different frequencies. And it just happened, maybe it's only coincidental, but it's a good start and it's worthwhile exploring further. And you probably are not gonna be surprised if I say that there is a lot of energy at the 200 300 mark. So whether that is the word of water for plants, I don't know. But obviously there is something going on with that frequency and, that, um, and the responses of plants that is worth exploring. We might not find anything. It might be absolutely just a, by chance it happened. But there is a lot of, as always, there is more questions than answers. But the questions are exciting. So, so basically, when you take all of these together and then you take one step further, all of this communication and sharing of information from different senses, and I'm sure that there is more, much more that we haven't even started asking about, is ultimately facilitating, you know, if you're a plant, your ability to thrive, not just survive, but thrive. And, and the best way to thrive, and any system does that, is to learn from your past experience, to remember what happened before so that you don't have to remember every single time. And, uh, and you can be much better at responding when the thing happened again and again. And I don't have time tonight, but this is exactly where we ended up <laughs> with the research. And this is exactly what we are finding. The plants are really good at learning. And they pass the same test and with the same flying colors as the animals would, in a very plant way, of course, but in the same, in, in a very similar fashion. So the questions that we are asking are the same, and the question, the the the, the processes that, that we are asking them to to exhibit are kind of fundamentally the same. So they remember, and they know what they're doing. <laughs> so I guess. Yeah, <laughs> this was a very long, millennia long gossip. Maybe we should give him the medal for the best gossip in history. <laughs> but unfortunately it wasn't very scientific, wasn't it?
He had no reason, no proof, and yet we have believed this story for a very long time. So much so that we have almost, and I say almost, driven the entire planet to the brink of complete destruction. Now, the beauty about the scientific method, and of course I'm not biased because I'm a scientist, but I'm not biased. <laughs> but you know, the scientific method is just, of course, one of the many ways of exploring and learning about being with the place, being here. And um, it's a powerful method that we have. It's not the only one. It doesn't have to be the best one, but it's a definitely a powerful one if it's applied correctly. And what I mean by that is that what the method requires is that you have an idea, you go out and check out what the reality of the system is, and then you check your idea, and if that and that fit, then it's like, oh, maybe this is a good idea, let's look a bit more. If it doesn't fit, you do not throw away the data. <laughs> you throw away the idea and the theory. And you let reality speak rather than your gossip. <laughs> but this is not what we have done. And this is a very touchy subject, of course, but if we take it from this perspective and let, a, let aside the emotional loading, because this is a very heated subject, right? As many other, but I thought I like the pictures, so that, that's why. <laughs> this is one of those cases where if you take it from an ethic perspective, from an emotional perspective, from a legal perspective, whatever perspective, there is always a lot of loading. But the truth is that if we look at it from a very scientific perspective, what we are seeing is that this, as we've seen at the beginning, requires control. It demands uniformity. And this is not what we need because this is not how this planet and this space works. So GMO, for example, whether you like it or not, as a, whatever, if you want to eat the GM food, go for it. But aside from whether you like it or not, is not a scientific endeavor. And so we should not be funding it as science. We should not be calling it as science. And it, why this is important, not just because I, oh, I don't want you to call it like science, <laughs> but because science in our culture still holds a very loud voice. So we kind of rely on science to validate what we know and so when we say the science of the genetically modified organisms is science, what we are saying is like, uh, well, it must be true, it must be good, it must be what it need, it, we need. And, uh, but is it the question that I'm posing for you to ponder in your spare time <laughs> is, if this is not science, then what are we really subscribing to when we are accepting some of these technologies. And if they are disrespecting the, the subjectivity of another, if they're telling not the truth about another, if they're gossiping on their back just so that they can be um, using them for specific uses, just as the plant biotechnology definition from the UN suggests, then we are not being very clear. And even in that own behavior, we're not being scientific at all. So either we, we need to choose, basically. What are we gonna do? Are we gonna be scientific? Okay, then let's be that. And let's remove out of the picture the things that are not very supportive of that approach. If we are not gonna be scientific, then it's fine. But then we need to revise how we speak about these things. And of course, I'd like to finish with this quote because I think it summarizes a lot of my blah, blah for the last whatever time. So thank you so much. So um, now I'm going to get you to turn your attention to your name tag. So there was actually rhyme and reason to all those coloured dots um, this evening. Those of you that have a yellow dot, can you please come down? Your team leader is Catriona this evening. 
you're going to be following Catriona down to the Burke and Will's room downstairs. So if you, yeah, so. Those of you who, who have a green dot, your, your team leader is Mike, so you... <laughs> go green! Apologies. Go yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Green! Where am I going? Um, von Mueller. Von Mueller. Yep. Okay, so to the Von Mueller room with you. Okay. Those of you remaining hopefully should have a red dot and you've lucked out. You've got me this evening. Um, and we are going into the Cudmore Library in a moment. opportunity to ask questions or curiosity about fungi. I'm not necessarily going to know the answer, but um, hopefully it will stimulate some stories. Other fungi have been used to clean up heavy metals, and they will actually concentrate the heavy metals into the fruit bodies. Theoretically, you could. It would probably require an awful lot of mess and an awful lot of concentration, but yes, um, you can literally collect the fruit bodies which have the concentration of heavy metals. Phosphorus doesn't, you know, it doesn't disappear. It gets recycled and recycled. Um, and in Australian systems, that's why too much nutrient actually kills our native fungi. When the Millennium Seed Bank project started early in my career, I was like, it's okay, they're gonna get them going, they're gonna get seeds sorted, and then they're gonna, you know, the obligate 90% of plants need fungal partners. They're gonna start saving them mycorrhizae so that when this Armageddon happens, They'll have fungi and seeds. And how dire is the department of the university? My, my understanding is there's no mycology. Completely instrumental as a society, a completely instrumental attitude towards them. Scientific method itself requires, as its very first rule, an attitude of detached neutrality on the part of the scientist. That animals do have minds, just like ours, as testified by the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness in 2012. And I take that metaphor to mean that rather than stepping back from the land, we have to actively address it as a collaborator that can and will join forces with us in some vital project or endeavor. Joining us to close the event is now, I need to get all of your multidisciplinariness in here. So composer, musician, sound artist, and acoustic ecologist, Vicky Hallett here, who's going to perform a piece um, in a moment. But I thought maybe I'd see, is this doing something? Yeah. I'll give you this microphone so that everyone can hear you as well. Um, how are we going? Yes, great. So um, I thought before you perform, we might just talk about like some of your methodology, just so that people can kind of get a sense of what it means to be an acoustic ecologist, because it sounds like a really cool title, but what is that? Um, and what is it that you're doing? So um, last time we had Vicky here, she actually performed one of her, her songs, which is the Elephant Song, and um, she often performs... Um, in and around animals. So although the elephant song was constructed on the on the voice of the the elephants and how they communicate. But also like recently you're in South Africa and you started playing and a hippo comes along and he started 
talking back at you. So you have this wonderful experience. But, you know, tonight I wanted to talk about, you know, your interest in trees because you started off, like your performance tonight was is something that you started quite a few years ago, but you're coming back now in your professional life to trees. So I thought I might, because obviously it's fairly clear, I think, how you might collaborate with animals, but, you know, talking about how you might collaborate with trees in your professional that's wow. a really big question, isn't it? How am I going to cover that? So the piece I'm going to perform tonight is one of the original works that I started with and I'd come out of a very mainstream clarinet background and I had to kind of think about what was my passion and my passion was acoustic ecology and the sounds of the environment. And the piece I'm playing is called Essence and it's really thinking about and working with the essence of sound. And each performance is different. I work a lot with live improvisation. And this is on the bridge to Botswana. It's a great bridge. So South Africa on your right and Botswana on your left. And I work a lot with getting multiple sounds at the same time. So I've got a, a mic, a directional road mic there, and that gets the air sounds. I've also got some clippies on the ground as well. They're omnidirectional. And you can't see that. You might see it in some other pictures. There's some contact mics on the trees. And then I've also got some hydrophones in the sand stuck into the tree roots. And then I've got some hydrophones just out from the tree. And the sounds that I work with I then develop that as a whole array of sounds and I'm working from the water, I'm working from the air, I'm working from the trees and I'm working in the ground. So I see it as a whole environment and a lot of it we miss out on because of our hearing. So by opening up these pathways, I can then create a composition and come out as a composer into an, in a public format and as an improviser and, and bring that to the people. And I do that for any age group. Uh, well, I am a strong advocate that everything we should do, we should do for everyone. And if you go to just flick through this sound. So I, I, uh, this is an overnight recording in the river that was dry at this point in the Limpopo River. And you can see I've got the four... Uh, spectrograms there and the top one and the second top one if you press it again it'll actually come out with a sound and the one that's got a lot of action is actually the one that is in the roots of the tree and you can hear there's a bird chirping there were some baboons in this one it's uh it's a tw it's a 12 hour recording and the hydrophones are in the ground and then I've got some clippies in the tree. And the one that's got the action is, is the one that's in the tree. So I really see them as a connector. And there's just another example. I've got uh, contact mics and hydrophones and some clippies. And that's just a water hole in South Africa again. We actually have very live environments in Australia. I love recording the dams in Australia. They're amazing. And this is something that's a bit close to my heart. It's a, an oak forest that is near where I grew up. And I recently went back there to try and record. Unfortunately, it is so dry that I could not get even a stick into the ground, let alone a shovel or a hydrophone. So I'm hoping to go back when there's a bit of uh, water in, sp in spring and I might be able to record it a little bit better.
that concludes this evening. So I'm hoping you can join with me to thank all of our presenters and speakers and performers this evening. So Monica Gagliano. <laughs> Sapphire McMullen Fisher. <laughs> Freya Matthews. Anna Madeline, and Vicky Hallett. Thank you very much for joining us at Science Gossip, our big experiment, and we do hope that you enjoyed the evening. Thank you. <laughs>